manner in which we appoint judges. So let me begin by asking Mr. Datar in terms of where he believes that things went wrong. And there's no question here that things have gone wrong, right? So, I mean, that, that, can, that is beyond <laughs> debate. So where did, where did it all begin? And uh, is the Constitution's text good enough? And if not, how can it be improved? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, first of all. Let me congratulate Orgo on this excellent book and this uh, perennial controversial topic. Uh, I don't hold a slightly different, I hold a very different view from me. <laughs> and I'm not such an opponent of the collegium. I must put a caveat, I appeared opposing the NJAC. I thought it was a terrible idea. And I'll make good my point. And I also wanted to uh, mention about that. We mentioned Justice Qureshi. I must make a disclaimer. I'm appearing for him on Monday. It's a very unfortunate provision. Now, coming to why did this collegium start? If you see the history of the, uh, the Indian political process, from 1950 to 1966, still Shastri was alive, Pandit Nehru and Shastri. There was not a single controversy on the judicial appointment. And there is, in the NJAC case, the Supreme Court called for the files and wanted to know what was the procedure earlier. And it was found that almost a barring one or two incidences, every recommendation of the Chief Justice was accepted by the Prime Minister and by Shastri. The difficulty came after Mrs. Gandhi took uh, power. Uh, what happened was you had a series of setbacks. You had the bank nationalization case. You had the Privy Purses case. So case after case was going against her. And then the first problem started with the supersession of the judges in 1973. That's the documentation of record. And that was a huge outcry. For the first time, the Supreme Court went on strike for a day. There was strike all over. There's a lovely book called The Judiciary Made to Measure by Kuldeep Nair and various people. So that was the first problem where the friction came into the open. Then she got overthrown by the, after the emergency, Janta government came to power. After the Janta government was again lost the election and she came back to power, this controversy started. And if you see the records, 115 judges were appointed by the Janta government in that period when they were in power, 77 to 1980. The moment she came back to power with majority, she said that all the people, we can't expect, this is an open statement made by the Prime Minister saying that we can't expect justice from judges appointed by the Janta government and the Marxist government. So this was the, and then there was a kind of a proposal to either transfer them or those who were additional judges not to make them permanent. And the records show that this is Justice Chandrachud, Sini Chandrachud who put his foot down and said this could not be done. And then you see the history, every government, now one thing was you can't blame the present government alone for trying to dominate the judiciary. I find when I did research for the NJAC case, after 19... 73, every single government without exception has tried to have its own say in nominating or influencing the judiciary. No less a person than VP Singh stalled 82 appointments, he kept it pending. Justice Sony of the Patna High Court was kept as acting chief justice for 18 months. So there is a huge history of this particular point. Now it's then after Mrs. Gandhi came back to power, this transfer policy, if you see, read Mr. Shu Shankar Menon's letter, it's quite strange. So all this kind of controversy came and finally, in 1981, you had the first judge's case and I must tell the audience, I was quite surprised to know, where did this word collegium come from? What's the origin of the word collegium? Ironically, it is Justice Bhagwati's judgment in the judge's transfer case. He says that no single person should have the last say, neither the Chief Justice, nor the Prime Minister, nor the President. It should be a collegium, but he didn't spell out who should be the collegium. So the origin of the word collegium must go to Justice Bhagwati. Anyway, the second judges came, they said, okay, we'll appoint ourselves. A committee of judges will appoint. And now, I must also mention one thing. Justice Shah also criticized the collegium. Many people have criticized the collegium, saying, you've become a law unto yourself. You mentioned that you have created unto yourself a constitution. You said, I'll appoint the judges, I will select the judges, I will do everything. Now, in the NJAC, if you see the judgment, that's not true, fully true. The executive still has a very large say. And if the government objects to a particular name, in the NJC files were called for and we found that in almost 90% of the cases where the government of the day had serious objections to a particular person, that person did, was not appointed. Then, now is a collegium a good thing or a bad thing? Now, we did some empirical data and there is nothing to show. I said take from 93 to 2015 when the Supreme Court judgment NJC came, X number of judges were appointed. You take the judges before that date. There is no evidence to show that the appointments have been bad or good. There are good, good apples and bad apples in every system. If you have 100 judges, you are bound to have 
by statistical average, there will be a few brilliant judges, there will be a few average judges, there will be some people who are not good, that's part of the game. So there is no evidence to show that the collegium has resulted in bad judges. My experience, personal experience is, Justice Kadju was the Chief Justice, he made recommendation of 17 judges. That was stymied and stalled by the coalition government for some reason or the other. Good people are appointed, you are not going through. Then through the Bar Association, we moved a writ petition. Mr. Venugopal appeared for us on that time. And it was Sabarwal who said, just Sabarwal said, please make the appointments within a particular period of time. That's how the 17 appointments came. Believe me, if the executive had it say, you would have had the most, a completely different landscape of the Madras High Court. Justice Shah also was responsible for stopping bad appointments. He just put his foot down. So where ultimately the collegium is how far the person there are going to stand strong. Because as you, uh, Argo says, it's going to be ambition versus ambition. You want to put your people in power. They don't want to put it. Ultimately, that's the whole thing. So now again, as far as the NJAC is the committee, we appeared in the NJAC. It was a very bad drafting of the constitution. They have gave veto power to the law, the, to the members. It was even. Now elementary law of meeting says you never have an even number of committee. You always have an odd number or you give a casting vote. Nothing was provided. You have a veto power which would have created chaos. You had one member who was supposed to be from a reserve constituency, one member belonging to the minority, one from the women. So all this kind of chaos was there. The act was a masterpiece of bad drafting. It would have led to complete chaos. And in fact, ironically, if you see the act, the act said that the NJC will frame its own rules and the rules will be placed before parliament and parliament can am amend it whenever it wants. So it's like a central exercise notification for toothpaste. They can change it whenever it wants. So that's why the NJC was struck down. And to the credit of Mr. Nariman, Till the last day, Orgo was on the other side, but till the last day, we told them that you have a committee. We, we don't want the collegium. Let the collegium go. We don't want full executive. Let have a committee of five or seven of which the majority should be judges or retired judges. They must have a larger say because they know exactly what is going to happen in the judiciary. The judges know who are good, that Surit is a good lawyer, Orgo is a good lawyer, so and so is not a good lawyer. They know the entire bar. They'll get a feedback. All we said was just do that and we'll withdraw the case. The government said nothing doing, we are not going to change a comma of our amendment and that's why the law went. Even today, if the NJAC is introduced with majority members being from the judiciary, we can replace the collegium and have a new proper system where there is a committee consisting of judges, some from the executive and some from say the speaker or the Lok Sabha or opposition leader, absolutely fine. And finally on NJAC, is this a system followed? One proposition put forth was, NJAC is put forth for uh, throughout the world. That's wrong. We did an analysis in the NJC. There are 213 countries in the United Nations. We made a survey of the judicial appointments in each of these countries. And there is no commonality that there's a committee appointed. In fact, it's extremely diverse. Some case the parliament appoints, some case the king appoints, some case the parliament appoints subject. So there are multiple appointments. So there's no commonality of our NJC's concern. So the proposition we said was, Let's tailor it to our requirement. We are a diverse country. We have multiple languages, etc. Let's have an NJC where the judges are in majority with representation of the executive, representing the legislature. This common body will be more than sufficient to solve the problem. It can still work. We can replace this collegium. We can remove this opacity and this cloud of secrecy and this thing. And just talking, if I just mention about this Qureshi's case, how it happens. The example of Kaju where the collegium was strong. See, for example, Justice Qureshi, which is coming on Monday. He was appointed, he was going to be acting Chief Justice of Gujarat. To avoid him being acting Chief Justice, he is transferred as item 5, Judge number 5 to Bombay, overnight, by the Collegium. Then he goes, he is selected to be appointed as Chief Justice of Madhya Pradesh. On the 10th of May, 8 Chief Justices were appointed by the Collegium, 7 went through except Kureshi. Then from a Madhya Pradesh High Court, which has 32 judges and a population of 8 crores in the state. He is then shifted to Tripura, which has four judges and 36 lakhs. Even that has not been appointed. All we are asking the court on Monday is at least get that appointment done and be done with it. La yesterday, nine chief justices have been appointed, or seven have been appointed. Quresh is the only man left out. So one thing we filed and we it was not entertained. We said how to solve the problem. Now we can keep on complaining about lots of solution. One solution I feel is to have timelines. Once the recommendation is made by the High Court, within four weeks, the government says yes or no. So after that, now for example, Kurish's appointment has come. Within four weeks, they must give the reason. 
as per the constitution, if the Supreme Court doesn't agree with the reason, then Supreme Court has the last say. Then within eight weeks, the appointment must go through. There should be clear timelines for each and every stage, from the lawyer to the high court, high court to the Supreme Court, and so on. And the tragedy of Quraysh is, para six of the memorandum of procedure says that if you are appointing a person as a chief justice of high court, you need not consult the central government. The consultation is with the, that state government where he is going. Suppose I am going to Andhra Pradesh, the notice has to go only to the state government of Andhra Pradesh. That chief minister must give his objection. Central government has no role to play. Mr. Narivan, who appeared along with us, he said that government is a distinguished communicator. It has to take the file and send it to the state government. But yet the government objected and it has gone to Tripura, which is again an unfortunate system. So if you have an NGAC which has suggested, we'll, most of these problems will be completely solved. Thank you. It took a long time, but my apologies. If nothing else, the case surrounding Justice Qureshi has shown us that there is an absolute lack of transparency in the way in which this entire system works. Because, I mean, we all know that the government at the time appears to have some problem with elevating him as Chief Justice of one or the other high courts, but we don't seem to know exactly why. I mean, this is reduced to the sort of realm of rumors and gossip and conjecture. No, there are two reasons. One, the Lokayukta judgment and the Sorabuddin judgment. Everyone knows it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, I want to get your views or go on the NJAC broadly. Hmm. But before that, in, I mean, on Justice Qureshi and on Justice Tahir Ramani, as I was saying, I mean, one, one thing is sort of a lack of communicating these reasons. That, I mean, obviously, these reasons cannot be communicated directly to the public and that's possibly one of the reasons why there isn't transparency in the process itself. But, I mean, rightly or wrongly, we now have a judgment in the Supreme Court in the uh, striking down the 99th Constitutional Amendment and striking down the National Judicial Appointments Commission. And in a system that is governed by the rule of law, one must pay credence to the Supreme Court's judgment. And, and, and if we don't, then I think the institutions collapse as a whole. So how, must, how can one sort of improve on this collegium process until we have in place possibly a fresh constitutional amendment to bring about a better NJAC, as Mr. Dathar had suggested. And secondly, would that better NJAC necessarily work well? Because I ask this question because we've seen how various different commissions of appointments have been working, especially over the course of the last four to five years. And with the diluting, for example, of the RTI Act, and one can have their own views on that, but the fact is that the RTI Act has been diluted. Can we necessarily be guaranteed that a commission of this kind would be more transparent than the Collegium? Yeah. So, I'm going to take this a little differently. I, the reason actually why I'm here today is a conversation that I was having with Mr. Ambi Srinivasan, who's here, uh, and who said that uh, since I've written this book, it's important to do a conversation that involves not just lawyers because a matter of judicial appointments is too important to be left to the judges alone. And I think that's true that so far what has happened is that we think of questions around the judiciary as not questions that are either comprehensible or the matter of serious public debate. And by serious public debate, I mean not only amongst the intelligentsia, but amongst lay people. The Supreme Court and the High Court still seem to be fairly removed from uh, regular everyday debate. So I think the critical aspect that we must keep in mind before any kind of change happens is that what is the political economy for that change to happen before we discuss what the substance of those changes are. And I think the great, the only reason as to why any changes will happen, whether it's at the behest of the government or the judiciary, is if there is greater public interest in terms of what's going on inside the judiciary, not just in terms of judgments, but in terms of the inner workings. Now, in answer to your two questions, if suppose that greater public interest does exist, then what does transparency a within the collegium look like? I think this is something that Justice Chalameshwar said when he walked out of collegium meetings. He said that the collegium meetings are essentially like discussions over coffee. And some names are discussed and then someone gets appointed. I think the, the most fundamental change that needs to happen is that there needs to be minutes of meetings that need to be kept 
that in the normal course that is 30 years will become public one of the key drawbacks of this book is the fact that despite my best efforts there was no meeting minutes or any primary material that was available because the collegium does not publish the reasons as to why somebody is appointed somebody is not appointed what the criteria used are what what is the background checks that have been done there's nothing that's put on record so i think the most fundamental change that needs to be there are twofold number one there should be a set of published criteria i think we need to know a few questions answers to a few questions number one is there a geographical quota in the supreme court is there a quota for women is there a quota for the number of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe judges what about muslims and minorities now everyone knows has some idea that you know some sorts of quotas like this do exist but no one really knows as to what that is because when you saw when justice km joseph was getting appointed and there was a back and forth with the government the government said that kerala already has one high court judge has one high court judge in the supreme court but who is to say that kerala can't have two where is it said there's if there was a criterion of that nature sure then if every state has to have one high court judge then we can understand so number one is that there needs to be some criteria that needs to be published i think that's basic number two is that minutes of meetings need to be kept we need to know the reasons as to why justice kureshi was sent not made acting chief justice was sent to bombay and then not sent to madhya pradesh and not sent to tripura i so think we need to know as to why that's taking place uh one other point one minor quibble on that uh, with mr datar is that while the memorandum of procedure paragraph 6 may not give the government that power the ultimate notification of that appointment has to be done by the president under article 222 so the government does have the power because the president is president acting on the aid of advice of the council so the government does have the power to give reasons as to why it should why someone should not be transferred regarding your second question in terms of whether the new njac will be better i am not a soothsayer so i don't know this is a hypothetical situation but the reason i strongly believe that the njac would have been a better solution than the collegium system in its final dregs that we are seeing today is because we were trying out something new and if there is a system no matter how flawed and with great respect to mr data there might have been a problem with the voting requirements and the veto requirements and so on but give a new system a chance let us see how it going to function when an old system is broken it's broken it's accepted that it's broken and we know and mr narivan who argued the fourth judge's case said in his rights in his autobiography about the second judge's case which is this saying that this is a case that i won but i should have lost and i think i with great respect he might say the same about the njac case in a few years <laughs> because the fact of because the fact of the matter is that when there is a new system we must give the new system a chance to function now it was new in two ways one is that you had members of civil society these were eminent persons who were members of civil society who were going to be appointed by a committee comprising the chief justice of india the prime minister and the leader of the opposition of the lok sabha now these were three different types of constituencies being represented and the importance of the eminent persons would have been that it's not a unholy alliance between the government and the judiciary so there is reason to believe that a this would have been different from the way in which the current system functions number 2 and i admit fully and i agree with mr datta that the njac act was poorly drafted it should have had a number of provisions regarding how the process of appointment and how it is to be made the transparency that's needed but my sense is that there was a better chance that that transparency would have developed in the course of functioning of the njac than we have with the collegium i agree entirely with justice shah that this is currently a system that is unfortunately broken if it can be revived nothing like it but it currently doesn't seem that way the njac gave us an opportunity to go in a different direction it might have been better it might have been worse but we should have given it a chance i mean i i'm just wondering i mean where this change is really going to come from because uh, i mean i i'm i'm also wondering if the executive is i mean the njac amendment was made sort of when the government was still new at the time and it's there's every chance that the government now feels that the collegium and the way it now functions is possibly a much better system for it to put its own judges than the njac and that it is easier to sort of influence the appointment process through the collegium rather than through a possibly a commission which might have entailed a little greater transparency 
And I know that Mr. Datar was at the end of the NJAC judgment, there was a short ruling that was made by all the judges where they agreed to look into the collegium and try and see how to improve the workings of the collegium. And I know Mr. Datar and Ms. Pinky Anand were sort of asked to take suggestions from the public and Mr. Datar had said that there were about 11,000 comments that had come from various different people on how to improve this collegium. So I'm wondering in who, I mean, in whose interest, I mean, is it in any of the, the judges or the present collegium's interest to actually work towards improving this collegium and where this change might actually come from ultimately? You see, what happened was in the, towards the end of the arguments, uh, just proposed that there's a memorandum of procedure and uh, as far as the act was concerned, by the time it was very clear that the act would definitely fall, it would not survive and then they appointed uh, Mrs. Pinkian and me as two member committee to get suggestions from the public and I'm so glad that all of you are here. We, we were supposed to get suggestions up to say, let's say 2nd of November. So till 11.55 in the night, we got 11,000 suggestions and I'm very happy to tell you that 90% were from non-lawyers and some wonderful suggestions came from the public. That just shows that how much the society is concerned with the caliber of judges, the quality of judges, the appointment of judges. And then we categorized them into five different compartments and this was put to the government to form a new memorandum of procedure but our entire efforts were, I don't know what happened to our committee report, maybe just gathering dust somewhere in the ministry. But one suggestion was that, look, as far as the collegium is concerned, how do you select, say, Orgo and Surit as good people? So, what we suggested was, let the collegium continue at the high court level. But at the Supreme Court level, let's start with this committee. One was to have a secretariat. Today, we, they, there is no formal, like there is no minutes, there is no, like in a board meeting, you have board papers, you have background papers to a particular decision. So, what are the background papers? What is? So, they said, let's have a secretariat, which will be, uh, doing all the administrative work, collecting the details about the candidates who are going to be appointed and then they will have some uh, process. Then they said, make it very clear, less than 45 we will not appoint them. Keep it a benchmark, however good you are, below 45 we will not be appointed as a judge. For Supreme Court, the age was 55. Then what are the basic qualifications? Should you have an income of more than 3 lakhs per year? So, they all said that put clear uh, uh, criteria which are known and then there is no need to, uh, like today is however good you are, you have to retire at 65, a high court judge retired 62. You could be the most brilliant judge but you have to go at 65. So like that if you have clear criteria, that was what we suggested, secreted we suggested and then we suggested that if you can't have an NJAC, at least have an independent committee with many retired judges who can be on a, have a panel of 15 judges because everybody can't devote full time. At any given point of time, five people can be called. Suppose it's a Tamil Nadu appointment. Get somebody who was formerly in Tamil Nadu and get. That was what we suggested. Let's have, see now, unless you amend the constitution again, the collegium system will continue. We have to live with it. There is no other option. The only way we can make it work is to have a better memorandum of procedure. And I think at the heart of it, you know, it uh, like somebody said, the constitution is not wild. It's we people who make it wild. You know, It's the people who operate it which will make it work or not. So if... At the heart of it, if your goal is to appoint good judges and all of you are committed, there will be no problem. But that, that's an ideal situation, it's utopia. We have to understand that every government has tried to influence the system. So we'll have to have some system which will be, which will insulate it from possible political interference by having objective criteria, some kind of an independent survey mechanism where people who are in the selection process are at least free from these kind of influences. So just to come in, just to come in on that point, I think Change can only happen if there is a crisis of some kind. Because as you rightly said, I don't think it's in anybody's interest, certainly not the judiciaries or the governments now, to make any change to an existing system. Uh, because I think it's working for both. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the fact of the matter is that I think a crisis will only happen if the number of Qureshis unfortunately multiply. I think it's only when we have these instances of egregious cases which, which frankly have no justification. I don't think there can be any justification for this. Uh, and it's only when these cases multiply that we may reach a tipping point. Because currently I don't see any prospect of either reforms of, uh, to the collegium uh, or certainly an NJAC 2. Uh, I, I, I frankly don't see it, see it happening. I'm sorry to strike a dispiriting note. Yeah, uh, just, uh, I mean, just before you start, I, I mean, there'll be a microphone that's passed around to anyone who wants to ask a question. And, 
I mean, this is something that we tend to repeat often, which is that if you can just keep your comments, I mean, down to questions as opposed to making comments. Right? My question is, President of India has got power to interfere like Croce's case. That is only my question. Yes. So, so actually, the power of appointment or transfer belongs to the president in the constitution. President in the constitution means the executive. The way in which the executive function is <coughs> interpreted is that the decision will be made by the Chief Justice of India and the Collegium and the executive will ordinarily say yes, unless there are reasons. Now, in cases like this, so certainly the executive does have a say in the appointment, but it should have some cogent reasons. Currently, it doesn't seem like there are cogent reasons in several cases. But one more point is that I don't always think that it's only the, certainly the executive and all governments have a vested interest in the judiciary. That's the nature of the system. But I think what's very dangerous today where we are living is the fact that the uh, impediments to the independence of the judiciary are not only from outside the judiciary. They are also within. So, a uh, quick question for Mr. Arvind Datar. You said that you had analyzed 213 countries on how they appointed their judges. Apart from India, how many other countries were there which had only judges appointing judges? That's the question for. And the younger people on the panel, you know, uh, as, as users, uh, we expect quick dispute resolution from the judicial ecosystem. Is there any other taxpayer funded mechanism that is more efficient or inefficient than the judiciary? I, both questions are to me or. These are younger people, they'll outlast us. No, as far as the uh, only judges, the only instance we found was the UK, where though the Lord Chancellor is part of the government, but he's head of the judiciary, and the judges appoint them themselves. Then they, of course, went into a selection procedure where we make an application which is criticized. But judges appointing judges was only in one Indian, it was the UK case. There was another one stray case from a small country which is virtually unknown, but uh, they, otherwise there is no, no such system. So this was perhaps by mean doctrine of necessity. The judges appoint themselves. But I want to repeat that the thing that judges appoint and they have the last say is not simply true. The executive does have a say, yes. Yeah, and as far as the, uh, the, 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 the other question about uh, which taxpayer institution is uh, giving a uh, thing. Less, less efficient. Well, I, I don't know. We got executive and legislature in India. So, <laughs> 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 well, at least we, we, we don't uh, go on strike and then not work like, a, like the parliament, etc. In fact, in the NJC, there was one sure question. You see, it, it, no, no, no. I'm not sure the strike is the best example. <laughs> no, in the NJC, there was a one lighthearted moment where there was an NJC amendment was passed unanimously and the only dissenting vote was late Ram Jaitpalani. So then the question arose, at what point of time is parliament unanimous? And they found historically that parliament is always unanimous when it comes to increasing their own allowances. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, I mean, just to answer, I mean, I, I don't think this is necessarily a case of judges appointing themselves. I mean, we tend to say that, but there is a role even in the present system, as we've just seen. I mean, we've seen the executive, I think, playing more than a fair share of its, I mean, having more than its fair share in terms of how appointments are made. I think on that, on that second point, as in we are unfortunately in a race to the bottom with the, in terms of how taxpayers' money can be used in suboptimal ways. But as far as the judiciary is concerned, and I think this is, a, this is a valid point and a subject of a different discussion, but I do think that we also need, while questions of appointments and so on are critically important, as in for the common man and woman and whether it be the indigent person or it be uh, a corporate, the fact is that the real question regarding the judiciary is one of delays. And I think. No, and just to answer a further point on this, it's not just the judiciary, you must take the tribunal system also. That's right. The other difficulty is a very, very small percentage of our GDP is spent on the judiciary. In fact, Justice A.P. Shah, myself, and the law secretary, we, we had to give evidence before a parliamentary committee on tribunals. And it was found that in many tribunals, there's no infrastructure. Now, if you don't give infrastructure, how does the thing function? So, if you compare to most countries, our percentage of this, uh, it's just 0 0.3 or 0.4 percent of the GDP is spent on the judiciary, which is woefully inadequate for our country. In fact, in Singapore, if you see the website, the law is supposed to be the seventh source of employment. If you just have more tribunals, can you imagine the number of employment you will give? This, uh, that nobody realized. Sir, uh, I have two questions. Uh, senior lawyers are recommended for judge position. One of the criteria is income. Uh, with due respect, what is the logic behind fixing a 
இன்கம் கிரைடீரியா மெரிட் அலோன் அஃப்கோர்ஸ் மெரிட்டோ ஒன்லி மெரிட்டட் சீனியர் லாயர்ஸ் ஆர் அப்பாயிண்டட் தட் இஸ் நோ செகண்ட் ஒப்பீனியன் பட் வெதர் இஸ் இஸ் த நீ நீட் ஃபார் இன்கம் கிரைடீரியா ஸோ மச் ஆஃப் இன்கம் கொஸ்டின் நம்பர் ஒன் கொஸ்டின் நம்பர் டூ இஸ் ஐ எம் ஐ எம் ஐ அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் ஃப்ரம் ஆத்தர்ஸ் பாயிண்ட் ஆஃப் திங் த ஸ்டேட் கவர்மெண்ட் ஃபைல் இஸ் சென்ட் டு ஸ்டேட் கவர்மெண்ட் பை த கொலேஜியம் டு சீக் தர் ஒப்பீனியன் வாட் இஸ் அ லாஜிக் சப்போஸ் எக்ஸ் நேம் இஸ் ரெக்கமெண்டட் ஃப்ரம் அவுட் சைட் த ஸ்டேட் டு அனதர் ஸ்டேட் that particular state government feels this gentleman uh, did not know the language of my state or like that vice versa what is that logic that there is a possibility of rejection the last point is uh, i was given to understand if i am wrong please correct me there is no uh, minutes are there i such a, i feel that there are reasons as properly cited in the Uh, uh, off-late and the uh, collegium resolutions. That itself gives a clear picture that uh, seniority point of view and uh, vigilance point of view, everything is there. If you go for minutes, definitely it will be critically analyzed. Thank you. Sorry, I have taken more. Can we have a bunch of few questions? Yeah, the first question was on income criteria. Income criteria. Uh, for senior lawyers to get their interview? Not just senior lawyers. Any lawyer can be, not only senior lawyers can be appointed. One of the criteria is income. see it income is not a very high threshold it's a minimum threshold but the idea is if a person is going to be elevated to a high court uh, judge's post which is a constitutional post he should have at least some kind of practice and therefore if he is reasonably successful he'll have x amount of income that's the logic can i only say that i mean uh, obviously there's income i mean different lawyers earn different amounts of money based on what kind of practice they do so all of this would have to necessarily be factored in and one can't have some sort of bright line rule saying that you know it should necessarily be above a certain threshold so all of those things will have to be factored in and possibly in the memorandum of procedure there has to be some sort of framing of rules which takes into account those kind of considerations it can't you can't necessarily say that you know a law, only a lawyer who is making sort of 1 crore a year can be appointed no, it's not that high it's yeah. quite yeah. yeah i mean it is uh, it's So it's about three lakhs. Ah, uh, it's about three lakhs. I don't know what's the price. No, but high court. It was two lakhs when I was in high court. It's about three lakhs. Three lakhs. Ah, uh, three lakhs a year. That's twenty-five uh, thousand rupees a month. And and just on the point of uh, and on the point of uh, reasons, as in with great respect, as in I don't think those reasons that are given on the Supreme Court website are really reasons because the fact is, and just to take the example that Justice Shah gave, as in when the recommendation was made to make Justice Nandrajog and Justice Menon. judges of the supreme court it was said that in taking into account the seniority and competence and they gave the number that they were in the all india seniority we find them the most suitable and then one month later when justice maheshwari and justice khanna were appointed again the same reason was given so is justice nandrajog more suited than justice khanna or justice khanna more suited than justice nandrajog only one can be right more oh, each of them can't be more suited than the other so my sense is it was a good start it was a good attempt when in fact now the supreme court has said that they are going to stop giving they reasons have stopped. they have stopped giving reasons from the last time so i think that we can do more Right. the logic uh, which the supreme court seems to employ for not giving reasons now is that it sort of tends to hurt the reputation of those whose names might be denied but i think that anyone who's sort of interested in being in public office should necessarily have to face those kind of reasons which might lead to their rejection so i think that's it yeah i am ramesh well we understand from the panel discussion that uh, human intelligence has failed the indian judicial systems Uh, in terms of the collegium on one side and the national judicial commission on the other side so when that be the case can we have a via media being worked out in the form of using artificial intelligence <laughs> instead of human intelligence to see to it uh, that uh, the entire uh, set of uh, persons who have been recommended by the state government or by the central government and all are being uh, beautifully uh, you know uh, run through through an algorithm and make that ticks happen <laughs> by which uh, uh, there can be no major uh, controversies erupting in future at least from 2020 onwards yeah so sir I mr arvind tata i want you to i think we can have a mix of human intelligence and artificial intelligence perhaps but you can't dispense with all no uh, see at a high court level and supreme court level you can't tick the boxes you know you're not appointing somebody a ba 2 years there are so many other factors is practice we have got diversity we have taken into account so many things so at that high court level and supreme court level So you can't appoint a minister on artificial intelligence. You can't appoint a general of an army on artificial intelligence. You necessarily require an interview process. You have to consider so many things which can't be defined or quantified into data. 
After all, AI will basically go into quantifiable data, which you can't reduce a human being to that at that level. Question up. Yeah, I may add some information to the question which is raising that uh, the artificial intelligence committee has been formed by the Supreme Court of which I am one a member. Uh, there are other members, uh, the Chief Justice of India, uh, the second judge, uh, the, 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 the senior most puny, and uh, some sitting judges and uh, retired judges, and the persons drawn from the in, uh, National Informatics Commission and uh, other work. There are two works which are already identified and where the work is being done. One is uh, translation of all uh, documents. Uh, 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 from uh, the lo local language to English, because that takes a long time in the Supreme Court to get translated papers and then to be made available to be fit for hearing. That is one. Two, from a, a huge d data, of, say 1,000 pages or 2,000 pages, when you ask a question as, uh, who has the personal witness? Or uh, is it corroborated elsewhere? You see a lawyer rummaging through the pages, running through the pages and finding a lot of time taking it difficult. Now, it's possible to immediately, if you make all the documents computer legible, it's possible to immediately raise any question, get any answer. They have run through a pilot, uh, probably uh, uh, Agya knows about that. In uh, Jharkhand, they uh, found how questions have to be done in criminal cases and that has been done. I've been tasked with a particular uh, work of identifying areas where, even if it is not artificial intelligence, we can put some system in place where automation will make it possible. I've, seen, I've said that the compensation, like a land acquisition compensation, or motor accident compensation, or any accident compensation, they ought to be easily amenable for fixing compensation without having to put through a human intelligence. It should be possible gathering data. Importance of collecting data and when that data is available, what is the compensation? It should be, therefore, it should move into immediately to a judge to say, if everything is all right now, make it possible. So, to speed up process. These are the areas where some work is already happening. Question upstairs. Uh, of course, uh, Rishikesh might be able to ask some of these questions at home. That's our son, but uh, nonetheless. <laughs> no, I'll steer clear of that. Congratulations, Orgo, on the book. Quick question. So, I surely you don't believe, Orgo, that change for change's sake is a reason to change anything, right? So, was your reason for supporting the NJSC in its previous form the fact that it solved some of the procedural challenges you spoke about? Now, the answer to that question is yes. Then why have the NJ, why have an NJSC? Why not instead just implement the procedural changes with the current system of judicial appointment? Okay, fair enough. So very quickly to answer that, uh, the reason as to why the NJSC was needed was because a the collegium system, the way it was functioning, was a broken. Okay, given the fact that the judges and the executive were not making decisions for the right reasons. So it was both a question of process as well as a question of authority. So what the NJSC brought in was a the need for a third independent type of constituency which is members of civil society which would not have been possible within a collegium system, number one. And the second which is actually an elephant in the room but we won't discuss it but if you want to know all about it read my book. Uh, it's uh, essentially because I believe that the collegium system as in the way in which it was envisaged in the constitution, in, in the second judge's case, I agree entirely with Mr. Sirvai that the collegium system and the judgment was a constitutional abomination. As in it simply has no basis in the constitution itself. It's a judgment which should not have been given in the first place. It was, there were very noble intentions that were underlying it. And if the parliament wanted, the parliament can create a collegium system, no problem. But it was certain, it was an act of judicial lawmaking that unfortunately, that was unfortunately given and then ran its course. So I do think that A, change was needed because we had to root out an unconstitutional system and B, it was an unconstitutional system that was not working very well. And so we needed a new system where we could incorporate these changes. Some of these changes could not have been done in the existing collegium because we could not have had newer voices which were brought on board. I still don't I still don't see your point of view because what I'm hearing over and over again in different ways is the problem with the procedure, right? So your problem, I think we all concede, you, all panelists conceded in the course of discussion that there was a consultative process already underway. The judges would consult with different members of the other branches of government and a decision would be taken. So the consultative process was happening in some form or shape. The procedure and therefore the outcome of the procedure was the problem. So why not in why not make what was unconstitutional constitutional by focusing on the procedure without changing 
fundamentally who are the gatekeepers and what the gatekeepers are doing. More than the procedure, chapter 9 of the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, congratulations. But uh, don't buy it, I got a free copy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, congratulations, Dr. Sen Gupta. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Dutter. Thank you for striking a, a bipartisan note about this shocking situation that we seem to be faced with. Uh, from a historical perspective, to use uh, Dr. Sen Gupta's word, egregious uh, situation, between 1993 and 2015, uh, could you enlighten us of certain other egreg egregious In, situations that have yeah, been actually, there? Why, I find that from uh, after 60, after 73 onwards, there are quite a few shocking instances which happened. So, when I see today, I mean, it's not just cough a total, it's not that this government is doing all that, it was being done earlier also. And that's why the collegium system came. But to answer to your question, as far as the collegium system is concerned, when we tabulated the number of people appointed through the collegium and otherwise, we could not find any empirical evidence to show that the collegium system had thrown up inferior judges or less caliber judges as compared to the earlier system. That was our finding. So my question is regarding who can be appointed as a Supreme Court judge. Under Article 124, it is not just the advocate or a judge. Even a distinguished jurist can be appointed as Supreme Court judge. Why has this not been explored until today? We are waiting for Argo to become 55. <laughs> <laughs> so actually it was, it was explored uh, when uh, there are two instances where this might have been the case. The first was when there was a serious proposal to make Upendra Bakshi a judge of the Supreme Court under the distinguished jurist Madhavan. category. Madhavan. 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 Yeah, and, and the second was as in a case, the case of Madhav Menon. Both were cases that were not seriously considered because, I do 